Well, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dan Richards, one of the marine biologists here at the park, who's going to introduce our speaker this evening. Dan. Thanks, Carol. Uh, good evening. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Christy tonight. Christy's um, been with the Reef Organization, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation, uh, for nine years now. She's been involved, um, well, since the beginning um, of the Fish Watch, or Fish, what do we call it? <laughs> It used to be counting. called the Great American Fish yeah. Count, well, and, and yeah. now it's um, more the, well, anyways, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the reef program. The reef program, the, the counts, <laughs> the fish counts, though. We, we started here originally um, doing the, what we call roving diver counts as just another way of, of trying to get an, a handle on, on what the fish populations are doing out at the islands, and um, we decided that this would be a, a good way for um, volunteer divers to get involved, and Reef took up the, the program, and they're based mostly in, in Florida, but Christy is their West Coast representative, and she's normally up in Seattle, so we're lucky to have her down here. Um, and she's got that program rolling, and uh, last year we added um, invertebrates to the, to the counts as well, so um, we're getting information now on that. And I think this is just a great program. I think it's a great way for um, the scientists to get a lot of information um, about the, the fish populations out there, and it's a great way for the public to be involved in it, and, and it's, uh, you know, it's a good, good program that they can do. So anyways, without further ado, um, Christy uh, has, is from originally from down here, did her undergrad mm -hmm. at, at um, UC, USC, and then moved on to Texas A&M for her PhD. Um, and then has been back out here to the West Coast most of the time since then. So mm -hmm. with that, I'll leave it to Christy. Great. Thanks, thanks Dan. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Dan, for that great introduction. And thanks to the National Park here and the National Marine Sanctuary for inviting me to be a part of this lecture series. It was quite an honor to be asked to come down. And, as Dan was saying, I actually lived in Santa Barbara for three years, several years back, and it's, so it's always a good, good when I get an excuse to come back and enjoy being here for a few days. Yeah, so what I'd like to, what I'm going to talk to you tonight about is this idea of, as Dan said, using citizens, using everyday people uh, like yourselves and folks who didn't necessarily go to college or graduate school to become a trained biologist but have, have a desire to learn more about the um, natural history here at the islands and throughout the marine ecosystem, and not only provide them an opportunity to learn more, but pr give data back that's needed and that can be used by scientists and resource agencies, such as the National Park and the National Marine Sanctuary Program, to better understand and manage these resources. So, you know, the idea of, as my title says, volunteer diver surveys, citizen science in the Channel Islands marine reserve network. This concept of using citizens, citizen science, certainly is not, Reef was not the first group to, to do this. Um, and it certainly isn't the first, the first, the marine environment was not the first place that had citizen science going on. Really, if you think back, arguably what almost everything we know about bird distributions in North America and throughout the world really comes from over 100 years of the Audubon Christmas bird count and people submitting their, their sightings of birds when they're out walking in the woods or taking a neighborhood walk every day. There's countless, dozens really, of citizen science programs now for birds. There's been folks for centuries reporting on weather and lighthouse stations. So this idea isn't new, um, but when Reef was, uh, Reef was getting started about 15 years ago, there wasn't really much in the way of uh, non-scientists, citizens, everyday, you know, divers, snorkelers, people out on the water to report information. So, we'll, you know, before we even go down the road of, I'm going to explain a little bit more about what REEF is all about, why bother even in, including doing citizen science? It, it does take a lot of work. It, it's, you have to have a well-designed program, well-designed methodology. But the, the, the reasons really are, if you think about, especially in the marine environment, but really 
all around our natural resources. The, if you go to a, a workshop that might be held by a resource agency or a scientific conference, you hear a couple of things. One is that you hear is that, well, you know, there's every year we have less money to do uh, the data collection that we need. We don't have enough resources, we don't have enough people to get the data that's required to answer the big questions that are really now starting to face people who are trying to protect and better understand the resources, such as, you know, we need data over a wide area and over a long, consistent amount of time. And while there are exceptions, many of the programs that are out there are very specific, scientific programs are very specific for a, you know, a specific individual species or maybe a, a group of species in a very lo specific location and typically, you know, for one to three years. And that happens to coincide with the life of a graduate student, usually. So um, <laughs> the, the idea that there is this need for data, and then there's also very, very little and every year dwindling more and more uh, money and personnel to be able to collect the data. And then on the flip side, there are people who are out in the environment every day, either on the water, swimming in the water, walking in the woods, who have this desire to learn more about what they're seeing. And so those, those really come together to be able to um, say, well, that, that's really why you do a citizen science program. There's these opportunities. There are clearly lots of benefits to volunteer programs. Um, obviously, it's a great way to engage the public. If you can empower people to learn more, by they learn more about the environment, they can, every time they collect more data, they're, you know, being a part of the system. If they can feel like they're contributing back, while at the same time, um, becoming really more of an active steward and increasing kind of an ethic of their stewardship in the, the resource. That's certainly a, a very useful thing. Um, and so there's also this idea of what I was saying, the idea of getting people more, they, they want to learn more about the resource that they're in. And there's, there's always a, a core group of folks who really take it kind of a step further and really dedicate themselves to learning every last thing. If you've known any very dedicated bird watchers, for example, the ones that will travel to see birds that they've never seen, it's really, they almost become quasi-scientists. And it's, that's a great thing when you can get a data that um, is coming from these folks who are really, you know, you could take them and a formally, they may be a, a, a school teacher or an engineer or a doctor, but they have dedicated themselves to learning so much about that, um, whatever program they might be involved in, whether it's fish or birds, that the data that they're producing can be really valuable. So I keep wanting to. And of course, there, it's a low cost. A lot of times, volunteers are bearing most of the costs that they're uh, going to incur to collect the data. And th that's really where the reef program got its roots. There was, as I said, a need for data in the marine environment. It's a vast liquid wilderness out there and the resources and manpower and woman power is uh, dwindling all the time. But at the same time, people are going through the process of becoming divers and snorkelers almost always because they want to learn more about what's underneath the water. They want to see. And so taking that desire and the need for data the reef program started in the early 1990s. Basically from, uh, it grew out of, there was a pair of marine uh, authors, marine life identification guide authors, Paul Human and Ned Deloach. And they, s about 15 years ago, were working on their first ID book for the Caribbean. When they went to fill in the distribution for each of the species, they wanted to put, you know, where is it found, in what sort of abundance. They really, they found out that very little is actually known about most of the, the species, you know, other than Caribbean. Well, there, there must be more variation than that, but there was very little published information on that. And so they decided, well, shoot, you know, if the bird watching community has been able to engage volunteers 
to collect data that can be useful. Maybe we can do the same thing with scuba divers and snorkelers. And so it kind of went from a very vague idea of, well, maybe they can just write down the information on the back of a napkin and mail it somewhere, and then somebody will do something with it, and to a very formal program that has since um, evolved called the Reef Volunteer Survey Program. As I said, it started in the Caribbean Florida region, which is where Reef is headquartered still today, as Dan said. Um, in 1993, the first data was collected in Florida, and it has since expanded to cover all of North and Central America and um, out to Hawaii. The first expansion was out to the West Coast um, in 1997, and then since then we've expanded down through Baja, California, all the way to the Galapagos, and then Hawaii. The program, we have standardized materials, uh, standard training materials, as well as survey materials that divers use while they're in the field, and then once they are back, to report the data back to Reef. Um, the method that was developed is called the roving diver technique. And the idea was really, the, the primary goal, remember, the first idea was to collect information that could be used to tell us more about where fish are found. What's the distribution of, of different fish species? So having something that could really capture the most, the highest species diversity in a given area. So they didn't want to focus on, on specific groups of species. They wanted to be able to have a method that you were really able to capture everything that was within a dive site. So that's why we came up with this roving diver technique, something that we could allow the diver to swim around an entire dive site and record everything that they could positively identify. Um, so that's kind of the one hard and fast rule is that we don't want folks guessing and uh, doesn't necessarily have to be in the field if they don't quite know what it is, but they can write down some notes and some, I, some characteristics come back and consult some guidebooks and some other divers that might have seen it too. And if they're 100% sure when they're on land talking about it, then that's okay too. They can still count it. But if they're still not sure, we ask that um, folks not, not count that. So it's kind of erring on the conservative side, which we want. Um, the, the divers don't actually count, even though we have, often you'll, you'll hear this idea of the fish counts but they're not actually counting individual fish species, fish. They're, count, they're kind of keeping a relative idea of about how many of each species. So single if they just see one, the whole dive, few if they see two to 10, many if they see 11 to 100, and abundant would be more than 100. And so it's a, it's a relatively easy uh, method, and that was by design. We wanted to provide something that had a relatively easy in. We didn't want to have to have too much training involved, very little equipment. Really all you need is a slate of some sort to record your information while you're underwater. And then they were, the diver will report their information on a scan sheet um, that, I think actually if we go back here, that's the, the form on the right. That's the, the piece of information. Those are, it, you record where you were, when you were, and all the fish species that you saw in which abundance category. Those scan sheets are provided by Reef for free. You return those back to Reef and then those are electronically scanned and transferred into data that goes into the database. Um, we are also, actually we have online data for the Caribbean region already, online data entry, and we're working on that for out here as well. So the information is reported back. We have, as I said, very, you don't need much in the way of equipment. It's pretty easy to learn. You don't have to remember very much. Um, and it's meant to be something that divers and snorkelers can do every single time they get in the water. It's not, oh, maybe I'll do a reef dive this dive. It's just something that they start to do all the time. Um, just like some divers always carry a camera. And, and that, so that was really the goal because we knew that if we wanted to get enough data to be able to say something about fish distributions and, and trends over time, ultimately, um, we needed a lot of data. And so we wanted to be able to engage as many people as possible. The method was developed uh, with a lot of input from scientists from the National Marine Fisheries Service in Miami, as well as uh, 
researchers from the University of Miami and the Nature Conservancy. And the original method was field tested over a course of a summer and then uh, the program was launched. The, as I said, the data are sent back to Reef. We take those scan sheets, those bubble sheets, and electronically scan them and convert the, those data into electronic files. Uh, before it actually goes into the reef database, there is a series of quality control steps that go and flag errors and potential misidentifications that enable us to follow up with a surveyor. If they, may, if they reported something that hasn't been seen before in a given area, that flags and it gives us an opportunity to look at who saw it, what's their experience level, and then sending them a quick email and saying, you know, hey, did you know you're the first one ever to see X species at a given site. Um, so there is a quality control, but then once the data are put into the database, that data is all available to the volunteers as well as the general public through Reef's website. And um, this is the website, if you haven't been there before, it's reef.org. And here, the Reef data, this really is the portal into those um, sightings. Anybody can go there and view summary data for Anything from, you can look at individual species, you can look at a certain, for example, in the Channel Islands, you could look at a summary for all the species that have been seen on a given island, such as Santa Cruz, all the way down to a site or up to all of California. Uh, so the geographic uh, scale can change. You can also query by date. And then a, a great feature for many of our volunteers is that they can look at, view your data. And that's that's been a great thing. People love to be able to track where they've done surveys and what they've seen over time. So the, what we have found is that often citizen science programs, because of this, if it's a well-designed program that is relatively easy and it's something that people want to do time and time again and uh, there's opportunity for growth through time, such as for our divers, it's this notion that it's not just limited to rockfish, for example. It's everything, and that's what keeps divers coming back, because every time, no matter how many dives or surveys a, a diver or snorkeler has done, there's always the opportunity to find a nut, some rare species or see something that, that you know, they haven't seen before. So this, net, this idea that it's kind of endless keeps divers coming back. And uh, this has really led, for, for in our experience, and this is a characteristic of many citizen science programs in general, is that you end up with a lot of data. And that's a great thing. Um, and we need a lot of data to be able to use it effectively. And the, um, the, there's a couple things about the, the Pro, our program in general, or specifically about the reef data, is that so some species shown here. This is a vermilion rockfish, and a, this is a cabazon, and those are, are commercially important species and recreationally important species. They're fished, um, and we we generate data on these species, but we also capture information on the whole uh, fish assemblage of a given area, which has turned out to be very beneficial as we learn more and more about how there's complex interrelationships in any ecosystem, the important role that painted greenling, for example, this fish on the bottom, plays, and how the, all of the species are, are intermixed and uh, interacting is starting to better be understood. And the reef data set, because we're collecting information on all the different species, is a great way to explore those um, patterns. So to give you an idea, now that's a general kind of overview of the reef program and the history of reef in general. To give you a sense of the Pacific, the West Coast survey effort, as I said, we have a lot of data. The, the database as a whole, we just passed the 107,000 survey mark. So there's over 107,000 surveys in the database um, that have been collected over the last 14 years. The majority of those are from the Caribbean and Florida because that's where the program's been going the longest. But out here on the West Coast, we're really, it's been quite an exciting time for me in particular because I am out here as the West Coast office because it's really, we're, we're starting to get to this point where people are doing it a lot. 
we're getting more and more data all the time. Um, we just are about to go, actually these numbers are probably old now we do, this is from a month ago, these numbers, and the, that's the neat thing about the reef data too is that we're constantly getting new data in as people go out and continue to do surveys. So we have a, about 10,500 surveys from along the west coast. We have uh, information from about 950, from 958 sites and we've engaged almost 1,200 volunteers. Um, so that's been, it's been a really exciting um, time. I think where it's the fastest growing region for reef right now. We have a lot of activity, as I said, lots of people who are doing it more and more and they're telling their friends and their dive buddies and, and hooking them into uh, the program as well. So a couple of interesting things that I'd like to share with you about the West Coast data in particular and the reef data set as a whole is um, now while I said there's about nine, there's 958 sites that we have data from, actually there's only 728 dots on this map. There are all these blue scattered dots all up in the um, Pacific Northwest and then along the, the California coastline primarily from Monterey Bay and to the south. Um, so we've got the specific latitude longitude location for 728 sites, which is the actually converts to be about, for the majority of our data, almost 9,500 of the 10,500 surveys. We know exactly where those data were, were taken. And that's a great thing because as I said earlier, the, one of the values of these large data sets is that you can start to look at regional trends, regional patterns. And if you have a data set that's been collected in a standardized way over time, uh, you're able to do that. And so being able to know where the majority of the data are from specifically uh, has been a good component of our, of our program to be able to provide it back to scientists and, and resource um, agencies. Another interesting <coughs> aspect of our program is that, and this is um, been a good thing for the utility of our data is that while, so we've got about 10,500 surveys and about over half of the data, 5,447, have been collected by 37 individuals. So we have 37 and actually some more if you start to look at the, the curve, but 37 people who've done at least 50 surveys and those 37 people cumulatively have collected over half of the data on the West Coast. So it's, it's great because we're kind of meeting mo both aspects of a citizen science program. We're engaging a lot of people and introducing them to the fun of learning more about the environment and the ecosystems that they're recreating and that they're spending time in. So they've probably taken a, a reef training class and they went out and did one survey or two surveys and they're slowly maybe going to pick it up over time. So they've been exposed to it. And then we have our hardcore group of these really the quasi scientists that go diving all the time and are conducting surveys on every dive. So it's providing a really robust aspect of our data and at the same time we're, meet, we're, we're able to engage a lot of people. So bringing it back a little closer to home, um, give you a, a little more detailed look at reef specifically in the Channel Islands, a little history. Um, the, as I said, the program started in Florida and the Caribbean. In 1997, we expanded the program to the West Coast with a lot of help from the Channel Islands National Park, the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, and the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. We had those three partners really helped us, the staff, to be able to figure out how to develop these, how to modify the, stand, the training materials and the teaching materials and the survey materials that we had that were developed for the Caribbean to out here. And um, it, it was great. Um, it was a good first summer. At that same time, as Dan alluded to earlier, there was an event going on that it was actually had its origins here in the Channel Islands National Park in 1993, about the same time that Reef was getting started in Florida, park biologists here came up with uh, an, this notion of let's get everyone to go out and do surveys. So it was actually a one day, a very time specific event. I think it was July 14th. Take volunteers out there and, and do some fish surveys. And that was called the Great American Fish Count. 
the, so that was in 93 or 92, 93 it expanded, started including divers in Monterey as well as the Channel Islands. So when Reef expanded to the Channel Islands and all of the West Coast in 1997, it made sense to basically take this great American fish count and envelop it into the reef's year-round program. So this idea that reef divers can go out anytime, anywhere that they're going to do a dive and conduct and collect data. And then we were going to, we use this great American fish count, which is now called the great annual fish count because it's just, it's beyond America's borders. Um, we use that as this one time a year. It's actually now the whole month of July. So we're in the middle of it right now. And leading up, usually there's events in June and then July. It's really a way to engage new people into the program. Uh, we try to encourage our partners to offer free training seminars. There's uh, several actually going on in this area as well as down south in the Los Angeles area in San Diego and up in Monterey. So if you uh, go to fishcount.org, that's the official event website. So really the great annual fish count is now an event, an outreach and training event within the larger year-round continuous reef volunteer survey program. So we enveloped that that into our larger program. In 2001, so we had been conducting survey, we had trained a bunch of divers and had data coming in between 1999, 1997 and 2001, but really in 2001 we started making an active effort to make sure that we had groups of divers going out to the Channel Islands every year on coordinated survey trips to collect data. And it was really in the hopes that we could start to down, way down the road, start to look at trends and, and patterns of fish abundance over time in the Channel Islands. And it, it was various ways. We either did uh, partnerships with the park and the National Marine Sanctuary, uh, taking groups out during Great Annual Fish Count. One year we did a bunch of training with the Long Beach Aquarium of the Pacific and used their volunteer divers to do several cruises to the Channel Islands. So we've really been, uh, since 2001, collecting a good data set from the islands every year. In 2004, in response to the Marine Reserve Network that was put in place, we started doing very coordinated, um, a long-term nearshore monitoring program that we sat down with folks from the park and with the sanctuary and also folks from the state, the California Department of Fish and Game, and said, okay, there's going to be a lot of monitoring going on, we know, for, for these reserves. How can Reef complement, what kind of program can we set up that will enable these volunteer divers to complement the data that's being collected out there? What, where are the gaps? Um, and we came up with, with input from those three agencies, a list of about 30 sites that were inside and outside of the marine reserves that either were not being really adequately covered by existing science programs, or maybe we just needed to, to complement what they were doing in addition. So we have a, a set of about 30 sites that we try and visit every year. These cruises have been uh, always on the, the sanctuary's research vessel, the Shearwater, and we do two to three cruises a year. And those are, instead of being open to anybody, um, we actually, offer those specifically to what we call our advanced assessment team, which are these people who have worked their way up the reef rank, so to speak, have done a minimum number of surveys and have passed skill level exams and are really that, that upper level surveyor. And so we provide the opportunity for them to come out and do monitoring in these specific locations a couple times a year. And then in 2006, as uh, Dan said we launched a Calif the California Invertebrate and Algae Survey Program. And um, I'll give you a little more kind of background into that. Uh, the idea, you know, a lot of people say, well, why, you know, you guys are a fish program. Why are you delving into the world of invert, you know, going to the dark side? Um, in, you know, delving into the world of invertebrates and, and algae. And really this is the reason. These are two stunning pictures of the underwater scenery of, of a West Coast dive. And the, the background, or what you see, is really, that's what you're looking at. And the fish are kind of an afterthought. You know, they're there, but this is the, this, you know, the invertebrates are so big and so colorful, and the kelp canopies, the, both the large 
gr tall growing kelps and then the understory. That's really, those are the things that people notice first. And unlike where in a tropical environment, well, yeah, the coral's pretty and everything, but the fish, that's kind of what a diver notices first. Um, so recognizing that that's the case, that a lot of divers are really wanting to know more about, about these prominent things, but also there's obviously a need for information on invertebrates and algae. Um, we decided to, to do a program out here, and actually we had already, shortly after expanding the prog program to the Pacific Northwest, we uh, had a similar program launched there, an invertebrate and algae, or just actually invertebrates, no algae up there. Um, and so we, and that's been a very successful and well-received program. So we knew it would work. We got some funding to do it, and after a lot of help from the, um, again, our partners at the park, at the sanctuary program, and at the California Department of Fish and Game, came up with a list of 63 key invertebrates and algae. So the idea that we couldn't apply the same count everything you see that we could with a fish because the fish it's a real it is a very manageable you can have success if you are continually studying and learning um, you can pretty much within reason do a dive anywhere uh, along the west coast and know almost identify almost every fish that you see um, it, that's not the case with invertebrates and algae so we needed to come up with some sort of manageable list we wanted the divers of course need to have success. You need to have some easy, res pretty quick results. Um, and so we didn't want to make it too unmanageable. And we narrowed it down, decided on 63 invertebrates and algae that were representative across taxa that, and that met kind of a variety of different criteria. Uh, so some of the things that ended up in this program are stuff, uh, species such as the green abalone, the one, this one here. Um, obviously is, um, has been dwindling in numbers all throughout its range. So that's an, a, an important one. Um, species such as the kelp crab that are a very important component of the ecosystem of a kelp forest because they're important prey and they're also important predators. Um, harvested species such as the rock scallop and then well I think if many divers had their way, it just would have been a nudibranch program. So <laughs> we, of course, had to put some nudibranchs in there. Um, and then we have also a handful of algae species, that, um, some of the tall, of course, giant kelp and bull kelp, but then some of the understory species, such as the southern sea palm. And then we included a couple of non-native exotic species. Um, this is one of them. This is uh, Andaria. It's the wakame Asian kelp. Um, and it, has, it's, it's, it was included because it is found, it has been found both in Santa Barbara Harbor and Monterey Harbor and other places along the coast. And so it, it, it grows actually, it's a pretty impressive algae. It's a one piece and they can grow up to five, the piece can grow up to five feet long. Um, so we're, it's, a, it's a great way to keep an eye on that and see if it, if it spreads. So that's been, that's really, we, as I said, it started, it was launched last year, and this year we're really starting to see data come in. Um, divers can go out and they can choose to conduct either a fish survey, an invertebrate and algae survey, or if they're confident in both uh, methodology, or both survey groups, they, it is possible actually to do both kind of at the same time. As I said, um, in 2004, we started this coordinated reserve monitoring uh, program at 30 sites that were inside and outside of, marine, of these marine reserves. And so this is our fourth year of data collection. It's been going really well. We use the, oops, we use the shear water, um, which is seen here in the background. This is actually um, the superintendent of the sanctuary, Chris Mobley. We were talking about earlier, and, and he gets to come out every once in a while, I think. They let him out of the office. So he came on one of our uh, recent monitoring cruises for a day, which was nice to have him. So here's a map of all of the locations, not just those 30, obviously, but all of the locations where we have data from the Channel Islands to date. Uh, 114 sites, just about 1,600 surveys since July of 1997. Um, and as you can see, 
thanks to this really coordinated effort to get surveys inside and outside of the those marine reserves, the green boxes are the uh, marine reserves, and you can see we definitely have done a good job, I think, of making sure that we have data from a nice stratified set of sites. And again, uh, we don't say these are our these are our survey locations. You can only do a reef survey in any in, you know here. So this number, 114 sites, grows over time as someone goes to a new site that hasn't been surveyed before. Um, so it's a dynamic set of, of data, but we do have that kind of coordinated effort to hit certain sites every year. So I don't really have much to tell you in the way of you know, what's happening with those reserves. As I said, we're in the fourth year of data collection right now. And as um, we talked about earlier, this kind of important benchmark is coming up next year, the five-year review of those reserves. So later this fall, there's going to be a series of workshops that the sanctuary and the state are uh, sponsoring to bring in a lot of the different people who are collecting data from the marine reserves, including Reef, to um, get together for a couple days and start to do analyses that can kind of tell the story. What is going on? And so that will be an exciting opportunity to start to analyze the, the data that Reef has been collecting, not just for the last couple of years, but for the last 10 years. Since, our, since we started the program and really help fill in that story that's to be told about the efficacy of these marine reserves. So stay tuned. I don't really have any, anything to tell you yet, but hopefully at the beginning of next year, there'll be a, a story to tell. So uh, I'd like to now just kind of give you a glimpse into some of the ways, you know, we talked earlier about um, the impact that citizen science or the impact that participation in the reef program has on the volunteer. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've had a diver say, God, you know, I've been diving for 10, 15, 20 years and I just, you know, it was just fine. I was getting ready to stop because it was getting boring or you know, I just never knew what that fish was and, you know, doing fish surveys has changed my life. Um, not really, but you know, it just, they, it's kind of that way. People, really are turned around by the experience of knowing. It makes such a difference to swim or walk through an environment and know what you're looking at. And so that impact alone really makes citizen science programs valuable. But um, it, as the data set gets larger and larger, that we, as we've experienced with Reef, the data has a very significant impact or can have a significant impact on um, policy and the better understanding of, of a system. And so while none of these the examples that I'm going to give you are really specific to the West Coast, because we're really, I think, in about five more years, if I come back in five years, I think I'll have a lot more to tell about how the data are starting to be used on the West Coast. We're just starting to get to the point where, where the data is going to start to be able to be really used. But just to give you a glimpse into probably some of the same ways that the data will be used out here, these are some ways that the Caribbean and Florida data have been used. So certainly species distributions. If you remember, that was kind of our original goal was just, and it, it seems so basic, but it, the information is not there for most species. Put on a map for me what the species pattern, species distribution pattern is for any given species. Um, and we've really done that. I think for the Caribbean now, the reef data is the most comprehensive set of information on species distributions. And now starting to look at species trends because we do have data from year after year in a lot of specific places. Um, this CDAR stock assessment, this is CDAR, I don't quite, can't remember the acronym, but it's essentially the, the way the National Marine Fisheries Service does stock assessments. Um, if you've seen those headlines that say, you know, X, Y, and Z fish are, are considered to be overfished. X, Y, and Z fish are on their way to being overfished. X, Y, and Z fish are stable at this time. The, those are the result of stock assessments that the National Marine Fisheries Service and the um, Fisheries Management Councils do these stock assessments. Historically, stock assessments were done using catch data, looking at where fish are caught, what's the effort, how long, how many days at sea, those kinds of things. 
over the last few years, there's been much more emphasis put on including not just the fisheries dependent data, but fisheries independent data sets. So getting a bigger picture of the of being able to assess a stock. And so the reef data set, because it's obviously fisheries independent, has been a great source of information for these stock assessments. And so most recently, the data have been used in mutton snapper, yellowtail snapper, and goliath grouper. And I'll actually show you a little bit more about the goliath grouper in a minute. Zone monitoring in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. This is similar to this uh, marine zone monitoring that we've started to do in the Channel Islands uh, several years ago. We've been doing for about 10 years in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. In, in 1997, that sanctuary implemented a series of no-take zones all throughout the length of that sanctuary, the length of the Florida Keys. And again, very similar, using this advanced assessment team uh, going out and we sat down with the, the sanctuary and said what sites would be useful for us as an organization to monitor. And so we have a set of sites inside and outside of the marine reserves that we use our advanced assessment team every year to survey. And we provide reports back to them on that. Um, the identification and tracking of non-native species. This is one that, you know, I think when you set out to, to do a data collection program, you kind of have it set in your mind you know, what's your primary goal? And for us, it was very basic, species distributions and hopefully trends over time. As the program grows and evolves, there's unexpected, unintended uses that all of a sudden show up. That's like, wow, you know, I, no one ever, I don't think, it makes sense now, but 15 years ago, it wasn't like we're gonna design this program to track non-native species introductions, but it's really been a valuable um, addition because divers who start to know what's out there they know what to expect on every dive and they know when they see something that's rare or doesn't belong and they spend extra time making sure it's not something you know that's common and they might take pictures they might call someone else over report it make sure that they report it and so that's that's been a um, nice you know unintended consequence of the data um, and the same, discovery of new species. Again, um, people, you know, divers who just see something that, you know, I've never seen that in any book. They take some pictures, bring over a, a dive buddy. We've had actually three different species that have been discovered in the Caribbean that were not known to science previous because of reef divers finding things that have never been found by, by scientists before. Um, Biodiversity hotspots for eco-regional planning, this bot uh, bottom one. This is an idea, again, possible because the reef protocol is collecting data on a wide variety of species, not just rockfish, for example. So we're getting a good sense of the biodiversity of these different areas. And uh, this is, eco-regional planning is something that the Nature Conservancy has been doing throughout the world and gathering data sets of all different types, putting it all together and looking at where are the sites that matter most? Where are those, the, you know, the last great places on earth um, that have a lot of species, these hot spots that need to be saved and protected? And the reef data have been used both in the, in the Caribbean and actually in the Pacific Northwest in this eco, these eco-regional plans. And then actually one at the very bottom that you can't see, but that I'll actually show you a slide of in a second, it, and this was another one of these unintended consequences. It makes sense now that we think about it, but the idea of simply looking at patterns of use for non-consumptive divers. It's the socioeconomic side of when you plan marine reserves, for example, or you're trying to plan for um, regulations. We need to know where people care about. Where do they want to go boating? Where do they go fishing? Where do divers care about? Where are the non-consumptive divers going time after time? And so it's, you know, forget the biological part of the data. It's just the, if you reef data, because of the big geographic spread and the, the time series can tell us a lot about where divers are going. Um, so the species trends, I'll just show you a couple of follow up with a couple of uh, specific examples. This is a species um, known as the trumpet fish. It's a Caribbean species. They're pretty effective predators on a reef. They, if, as you can see, they're lion weight predators. They hang uh, vertical 
and kind of blend in or try to blend in with Gorgonians, buoy lines, divers, um, anything that they can kind of blend in with and they'll just wait for, for any small to medium sized fish swim just a little too close and they slurp it up with this giant um, trumpet shaped mouth that opens actually quite big when they open it. Um, so they are, you know, I think if you ask any given diver, you know, are trumpet fish, you know, you see them on most dives, yeah, they're, you know, they're definitely around. Um, and they are, they're kind of one of those species that you see most places that you go in the Caribbean and probably on, you know, one out of every three, four, five dives. Um, I happened to be working up some data from the flower gardens earlier this year and saw that trumpet fish used to be a species that you saw 20, 30 percent of the time. And for the last three years, no one has seen a trumpet fish there. I thought, well, that can't be right, really? So I actually looked at, at all the data from the reef database and found, so these lines correspond to pretty broad geographic areas, the Cayman Islands, pa Bahamas, Bermuda, Florida, uh, the dry tortugas. And all of these places that I looked at um, are, this is uh, 1996 to 2006. So over a 10 year time frame, this is sighting frequency. So 70% of all surveys from any given area down to zero. And you know, 20 to 50, 60, 70 percent, and over the last four or five, six years, they've just been declining, 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 declining. So, um, you know, wow, <laughs> what's going on with the trumpet fish? We don't know, but it's certainly a, a great first step to be able to turn this information over to scientists, a graduate student maybe, um, resource agencies and say, you know, this is something you might want to keep your eye out on. It's um, definitely more than just a little blip. It's happening region wide. Um, and, uh, you know, the, where no other data set out there has information on trumpet fish, they're not a fish species, but they're very ecologically important on a coral reef because of their predatory status. and. Um, so this is just one example of both a, a regional decline, a regional trend that we've been able to look at, but also something, a non-fished species, but that could have ecological um, impacts. The Goliath grouper, this is one of those stock assessment um, stories. The Goliath grouper is, uh, all, has, was previously known as the Jewfish. They're very large. They grow to be very large, and um, they had been historically throughout much of Florida and the Caribbean, but had been subjected to very um, uh, low numbers over the last 20 years. They had been fished almost to extinction in many locations, including Florida. And so in the early 1990s, Florida, as a, they closed the fishery to Jewfish, to Goliath grouper. There was no longer any, you couldn't, they were closed to take. Um, and the Jewfish, the Goliath grouper, responded very well to that management action. Um, they, res they rebounded. Some fish species, for a variety of reasons, if they've gotten to a low enough point, you can close the fishery and it's just not going to do anything. But for this species, it worked. And they rebounded. And people started to notice. You could do it was pretty incredible. Within four, and it was a pretty quick, four to five years, quick for fish. Four to five years, you could dive on a, on a wreck on the uh, west coast of Florida and see two, three, four Goliath grouper on a, on a reef. And that was, that's amazing because these are huge. And um, word got around and people started to think, well, maybe it's, you know, maybe we can reopen the fishery. Let's start fishing them again. They seem to have gotten, come back. Um, and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and many scientists kind of had the sense that, well, it's probably not quite time. It hasn't been long enough. Um, it may seem like they've, they're back, but they're certainly doing better. But is it time to reopen the fishery? Let's do a stock assessment. Well, you can't do it. They didn't have any fisheries data because there was no fishing on this. So they had no catch data to use to be able to evaluate the stock. And um, fortunately, Reef had been, so this was in the late 90s um, that this issue came up, and Reef had been collecting data in Florida since 1993. So we were really the only data set that they had to use other than a couple of um, specific science research programs that were collecting data from a pretty limited area in Florida. 
So uh, the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission used the data to be able to look at, there was a lot more that went into it than just these maps, but, um, and so this is the early 90s and then the mid 90s and then the late 90s. And certainly their uh, presence is being found more and more throughout the state, but really it was, they were still only being seen in about 10% of the surveys. And so the data basically was enough to be able to say, well, it's not quite time to reopen that fishery. So interestingly, the, that, the question has come back up right now. So we've provided them the, an updated data set, and it'll be interesting to see what the analysis says this time. Um, this is this non-native species, this, the exotic species idea. Um, several years ago, we had more and more reports coming in. The map shows um, a close-up of the east coast of Florida. This is Broward and Palm Beach County, so Fort Lauderdale is in Broward County, Palm Beach, Miami is down here. And um, started getting more and more s reports from divers who were saying, I'm seeing an Indo-Pacific um, emperor angel. I'm seeing sailfin tang. These are species, uh, the four pictured here and all the ones labeled here. There's actually 19 different species that have been seen that are native to the Indo-Pacific and the Red Sea. Um, and this was something that probably would have gone unnoticed because they're not, none of the species yet, fortunately, have exploded into, you know, the reef being taken over by thousands of Moorish idol or anything. But um, so it's something that the reef data, the reef divers really noticed. We, so Reef as an organization put out um, some uh, outreach materials, put posters up in the, in, it was a very specific geographic area and was able to um, you know, really encourage people, make sure if you see any of these, we did some least wanted posters and that kind of stuff. If you, um, if you see any of these, make sure you report it back to Reef. Even if you're not doing a Reef sighting, we set up a, a um, form on our website and um, ended up with a really nice data set that we were able to give back to the state and say, you know, you, you have a, something going on here. This is a, quite a hot spot of non-native species. Really, when you went further south, you didn't really see them. And if you went northern, more north, it, you weren't seeing them. So um, just having that information alone to the state was able to let them start to do some monitoring. But also, some folks at the University of Washington took our data. And because a lot of times when you hear about non-native fish introductions or non-native species introductions, ballast water is the usual kind of suspect. But everybody knew these fish aren't coming from ballast water, but we wanted to make sure they looked at the fish species that were being seen, what their native range is, and then looking at the ports of call from fish, from boats, container ships that are coming in and dumping off ballast water, and where their last ports of call were, and then also looking at what the marine life import data is for the state of Florida, and was able to conclusively say that these are definitely the result of really probably well-meaning for the most part aquarium owners, home aquarium owners, releasing fish um, that, you know, they don't want to flush them down the toilet. So that was an interesting uh, revelation and there was, we started, we were talking a lot with the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission about the kind of ongoing and okay, well now we know the source for sure, what can we do about it? Well, let's, you know, let's educate them tell them, you know, here are your options. Don't dump them. Well, for start, you know, it's illegal, but here are some ecological reasons why you shouldn't. But then, you know, take your unwanted fish back to the place where you bought it and, and get a credit, you know, exchange it for something else. And somewhere along the email chain, all of a sudden, someone from Fish and Wildlife said, they can't do that, actually. To be able to, you can't return at the time. You couldn't return an aquarium fish that was non-native and get money for it. Um, because you had to have a, a you know, you had to be, have a license to um, do that. And so, really, is that really the law? And everybody kind of went back and forth, and it turned out, yes, that's definitely right. So that ended up kind of going into a, um, their, the policy, their, the legislation was changed, and they also set up, the state set up amnesty days where folks could bring back their, their species, <laughs> their unwanted <laughs> fish to, you know, um, different participating aquarium stores and so that's that was a, a neat um, kind of snowball that again this unattended consequence um, that has grown through time of the data and then this is the last example that I'll show you and this brings it back to this coast 
Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Marine Life Protection Act that is uh, going, that was passed, and there's now this series, this network of marine reserves that's trying to be implemented all throughout the, the coast of California. They're doing it in regions, and this was the Central Coast region shown here, the Central Coast region um, part of it. And part of that, as I said, is you know, you've got gathering, figuring out, okay, where do we put the marine reserves? Where are the little boxes going to be drawn on the map? And a lot of information plays into that. And one of the important pieces is the socioeconomic, you know, there's the biological features. Um, and the reef data were used in that, in the biological mapping to look at what is what does the biology tell us, what's ecosystems. Um, but also, what matters to the people? What's the socioeconomic part of where we might draw the boxes? And there was um, a need to know where do non-consumptive divers go? What do they care about? And the reef data set was a great way to be able to answer that question. So this is um, a map that was published in the planning process document that basically used reef data. The, the yellow dots are all reef locations um, along the central coast. So to wrap it up, um, getting involved with reef is pretty easy. You can go to the reef website. You can, for starters, I encourage you, if you're not already, join reef. It's free. Um, you don't even, you know, don't have to be a diver or snorkeler. You might just, you know, want to hear more about what we're doing. We issue uh, monthly e-newsletters and we do printed newsletters a couple times a year. And um, so you can go on our website and join for free. The, if, you're, if you are a diver or snorkeler, the easiest way to get involved is really check out the website. Um, as I said, it's easy to kind of be self-directed. We also encourage to attend a training seminar. There's always several in the area during the months of June and July with the Great Annual Fish Count. Other dive shops and groups offer seminars throughout the year and coordinate. The Paradise Dive Club up in Santa Barbara is really good about coordinating um, periodic fish survey dives. And they actually, so on the back of the, in the back of the room, there's a flyer about a, a Great Annual Fish Count uh, dive that the Paradise Dive Club is organized to the islands at the end, towards the end of the month and they'll do a seminar on the way out there and, and Truth Aquatics has generously offered to provide 20% discount to anyone who participates in that diving day so feel free to take a flyer on that S and you know really just starting taking a slate starting to write down what you see and you know even beginning data um, can help so feel please, you know, start to do surveys and um, even if you feel like you're not noticing everything yet, um, get with some friends and that always makes it more fun, kind of, you know, the fish, fish squad, so to speak. Um, so you can, it's really, as I said, something you can do on every dive going out there or, you know, just participate in the Great Annual Fish Count. We also organize um, coordinated, basically, eco vacations. We do one to Monterey Bay every year. We do Hawaii and Caribbean locations and down in Baja, Mexico. So um, that's another. They're usually led by reef staff, and we do dives all week and training seminars in the afternoon. The Great Annual Fish Count, as I said, is another good way to get introduced to reef and take a training seminar. Uh, Fishcount.org is the website, so that has a whole listing of events going on. And finally, you know, to bring it back again, um, citizen scientists, I think it's a, it, it certainly is a really exciting um, opportunity to learn more about the ecosystem that you're, you know, that you're in and um, becoming more involved and engaged, but also contributing back to understanding, affecting change, changing laws. Um, so with that, I will uh, take any questions. Thanks.